and welcome to another edition of Clarity Conversations. I'm Alicia Mayo, the founder and executive producer here at Clarity Media. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can find me at C-L-A-R-I, capital T, media on YouTube, Facebook, and on Instagram. November 3rd, election day, is less than a month away. Today, we'll look at candidates the issues and key battleground states, as well as strategies that are used to sway our votes in one direction or another. And joining me in this conversation is Professor of Politics at the University of San Francisco, Professor James Taylor. Professor, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me back, Alicia. The presidential and vice presidential candidates listed on the mail-in official ballot that I've received in the mail, along with others, um, include six parties and a space for a write-in candidate. They include the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, uh, the Democratic, Republican, Peace and Freedom, and the American Independent Parties. Some names are familiar, most are unfamiliar uh, candidates. Choice is nice, but why does it always boil down to this dogfight between Democrats and Republicans? Well, that's a great question, uh, and, and Americans definitely need another uh, competitive party. Uh, we need, we need about three more competitive parties in order to really bring about democracy in America. The two parties play off against each other. Uh, Tweedle Dee and Tweedle Dum is what we have in most uh, introductory to American government texts. Uh, when you get to the chapter on political parties, which is about chapter eight or nine, uh, we have a whole section called Tweedle Dee and Tweedle Dum. The two major parties actually work together and conspire together in all 50 states to prevent um, competition. So those minor parties that you list actually were very successful, uh, most of them in achievement. The challenge would be and the task would be to find a progressive party um, that would be representative of, of an array of you know people's interests and, and perspectives um, uh, that uh, you know, committed to to, to democratizing the political process and and to bring about democracy in America. But the two major parties we have uh, is largely um, uh, prevented, I think, from really happening with our two parties. Uh, for example, the way Mitch McConnell is conducting himself in the Senate, the way he's behaved with the Supreme Court seats, the way he's behaved with the impeachment of Donald Trump, who earned his impeachment. Um, the party system is something that the framers of the U.S. Constitution did not account for. And so they assumed that the Senate majority leader would behave like a Senate majority leader when it came time to a president who earned impeachment. Even if uh, he disagreed, he would still allow for a, a fair process. And, and what we saw, Americans needed to listen to carefully what Trump said. When he bragged at the debate that Trump, that, by, that Obama and Biden left about 130 uh, federal justice uh, seats. Um, when he bragged that they left about uh, 130 uh, federal uh, judgeships unfilled, uh, uh, what the real cause behind it was not because Obama didn't want them filled or because Biden and Obama were the way he did for the Supreme Court seat. So Mitch McConnell prevented them uh, from being seated under Obama to have a permanent effect on the shape of the law and the nature of law in America for the next 50 to 60 years. They're playing long ball. And the Democrats, to me, uh, they play basketball like the Washington Generals, who is a team that is all them globetrotters because mm -hmm. Democrats keep trying to find a way to lose. Uh, you know, they're right now, they're up by double digits and everybody knows they're going to lose. Um, and most of America is pretty confident that Donald Trump probably is going to win even though everything says he's going to lose because the Democrats are a weak party. They've always been weak. Um, at least they've been weak since, I'd say, since Ronald Reagan made them weak. Since the 80s, the Democrats have gone soft, trying to be safe and centrist, and that makes them weak. Instead of being strong and liberal uh, and progressive like under FDR and LBJ, just own who you are, be progressive. And the Democrats, since, since Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan uh, in the 80s and 90s, have uh, become a party that is indistinguishable from the Republicans in terms of, 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 of most things, except for the more you know, draconian policy positions that the Republicans hold. But in terms of the, the functions of the two parties, 
Um, like I said, in most political science scholarship, they're called Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Okay, that gives us some hope. <laughs> um, okay, so we have Trump and Pence versus Biden and Harris now, red versus blue. We have had the two debates already, uh, flies on Pence and Harris, feminine energy described by Trump as monstrous as he himself interrupted and couldn't follow the game rules with Biden, who at one point shouted at Trump to shut up. Now, if I were to use that same approach to be heard, I'd be considered an angry black woman with a bad attitude, yeah. right? It's not a good look for anybody at this point or at any point, uh, let alone a presidential candidate. Yeah. No, but I, though, I don't know if you want to comment about that. To me, those aren't the real issues. To me, yeah. the primary issues are domestic issues. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, no, I, I think we've seen a whole lot of, of, of uh, white men uh, screaming out when they want to whether it's Biden telling the president to shut up and calling him a fool and, 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 and you know, other things that no, in the normal presidential cycle, Biden's uh, comments would have been fatal. Um, they would have been fatal um, debate mistakes that would ruin uh, his career. You know, no different than Howard Dean scream out Wuha or Rick Lazio in New York in the Senate race, walking too close to Hillary, intimidating her physically on stage. That would have been that moment. But in the, in the, um, the, the, the maelstrom that is Donald Trump and, uh, and the chaos that is Donald Trump, um, almost everything uh, is forgiven now. And, and I think that's sort of the double standard. The, Demo the Democrats continue to impose a double standard on themselves that I think is fatal, that they continue to play by the rules and try to take the high ground. And the Republicans are stealing um, Supreme Court seats, betraying openly their promise never to have a Supreme Court um, nomination process so close to an election, and they stopped Obama seven months out before his presidency ended, um, and now they're doing it as elect five million votes have already been cast, and they're doing it now. Um, this is almost uh, so hypocritical um, that it just, it, 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 what stuns me as a student of American history is, is how the majority population is responding to all of this as if it's not serious or real because it doesn't affect them. So, so in a real way, it's almost like they're willing to forgive Trump of all of his other transgressions as long as he satisfies this cathartic feeling of dealing with um, the minority population as the majority population finds itself in distress in every state in the union in terms of its population decline. Uh, compared to uh, uh, whites all over the world, the American white population is in decline, um, has a shorter life expectancy. Uh, we're talking about you know, the, the opioid crisis, where 130 are dying per day and are out, outpacing gun deaths and auto deaths, opioid suicide and opioid-related deaths. That's, and that's almost exclusively uh, for whites and there's nothing in the crack era that comes close to that. There weren't 130 brothers being shot and killed a day, even in the worst day of the crack era. And yet 130 white people are dying a day because of opioids and you know they're treating it as a medical health um, crisis as they should have treated uh, every other drug problem in, in society. Um, but again, the two party system to me uh, and, and, the, and the moment in where we are uh, you know, we're at a, a, a to me, at a, at a low point in politics where uh, the majority population uh, really needs to articulate um, through the election that it repudiates all of this. And if it doesn't, then we are in a real um, mess going forward because we have to live in a country where they are saying this is acceptable to them. And to me, this is unacceptable. And so to me, these two things cannot coexist. Black, the black population, unlike the white population, is actually exploding. The African-American population by 2065 is expected to be 55, 65 million. By 2075, they expect the black population to be 75 million people. That's 30, 40 years, that's 50 years from now, right? And at the same time, the white population is in such sharp decline um, 
and the Asian population is doubling, the Latino population is growing exponentially in every county in America. And so the only population in decline in America is the majority population. And so what we're seeing in terms of a lot of the political uh, 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 you know, manifestations of it are this sort of, you know, uh, if we can't have it, you can't have it. Let, you know, we'll take it down. We'll bring America down before we let the minorities have it. This kind of sickness is a, a result of a, 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 a vast social transformation that is happening that everybody is experiencing and that it creates anxiety for everyone but these people, because of their default racism, think that they have a special right to make a special claim on this transformative moment affecting everyone, like it's their kingdom falling down. This has never, for five minutes, been a white man's country. They dominate. Out of chaos comes clarity. Subscribe to Clarity Media on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, and on Instagram. I'll have more of this conversation with political scientist Dr. James Taylor of the University of San Francisco. Thank you so much for tuning in.